Good morning and uh, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Before um, um, today, is the, um, the fifth annual Global Health Day, and it's a really exciting talk this morning and then later on today. But before we introduce our main speaker, a couple of announcements. Next week will be Scott Friedman, who is the uh, Dean of Therapeutic Discovery at Mount Sinai, and the title will be Nash and Hepatic Fibrosis and Emerging Therapeutic Frontier. And the week after next will be the Sam Samuel Thiel um, annual, 19th Annual Lecture in Health Policy, and Dr. Koh from Harvard will uh, talk about uh, uh, controversies in policy in tobacco control. Reminder that we have no uh, commercial support for going rounds in the conflict of interest. And then for diagnostic of the week, Janet will present Janet. All right, call of the week. So a 70-year-old gentleman presents with right upper quadrant pain to the emergency department. He has a history of non-insulin-dependent diabetes, chronic low back pain um, on chronic opioid medication treatment, arthritis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia. Um, comes in with right-sided flank pain radiating to the front for the past five hours or so. Pain is described as 8 out of 10, colicky, worse with inspiration and movement, radiating to the back somewhat and associated with nausea. Review of systems is otherwise ne negative for shortness of breath, chest pain, fever, vomiting, diarrhea. He's a non-smoker, no alcohol or other drugs. Uh, in the ED, his temperature is 99, blood pressure 124 over 79. He's tachycardic to 108, uh, respiratory rate of 21, and satting 97% on room air. Um, labs were grossly normal except for a white count of 16.1. Uh, chest x-ray done in the ED showed lung low uh, low lung volumes with bronchovascular crowding, um, some bibasilar or patchy opacities. Uh, given concern for the right upper quadrant pain, the ED ordered a CT abdomen pelvis, which was grossly normal. Um, there was note of a gallbladder that appeared distended, but without evidence of pericholocystic, uh, pericholocystic fat fluid or fatty infiltration. So he was then admitted to the floors with concern of cholecystitis um, and a potential uh, pneumonia. That same evening on the floors, once the medicine team saw him, his temperature had peaked at 100.4, his blood pressure is 96 over 64, um, his pulse is 89, and he had a new oxygen requirement of 90% on three liters nasal cannula. On their exam, he was generally uncomfortable wincing in pain. Lungs were clear with diminished breath sounds at the bases, and there was tenderness to palpation over the right ribs um, anteriorly and laterally. His abdominal exam was soft. There was the right upper quadrant tenderness to palpation. Somewhat of a Murphy sign could be elicited, but no rebound and no guarding. Um, despite the in admission um, diagnosis from the ED, the team um, considered his sudden onset of pleuritic um, and reproducible right upper quadrant pain, his continued sinus tachycardia, his low grade fever, and his new hypoxia and broadened their differential uh, to include rolling out a PE. So on CTPE, he actually had a large PE with infarction um, in all, that was extending to all three lobes of the right lung, um, as well as some subsegmental and segmental emboli with infarction in the posterior left lower lobe. Uh, so PEs um, have also been referred to as the great masquerader, um, in addition to syphilis. Um, in patients with PE, only in the segmental pulmonary branches, uh, the general symptoms that we look for, like dyspnea, Pleuritic chest pain may be mild or absent, uh, leading to underdiagnosis. And abdominal pain as a presenting symptom is rather uncommon, but there are case reports, um, and there's an estimate of maybe 6 to 7%, according to one annals uh, review. So for resisting the, uh, the, resisting the effect of um, anchoring and for continuing to search for a broader differential and um, mon modify their, um, their clinical judgment. Uh, call of the week goes to doctors Caroline Walker, Isabel Bazan, and Nora Seeger. So today's speaker is Majid Siddig, and to introduce Dr. Siddig, I'd like to, uh, as Dr. Rastegal, who chairs our global health program here, to introduce him. Thank you. Ask well, uh, welcome to Medical Grand Round. Uh, I'm delighted. Uh, I have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Sadiq, 
Many of you know Majid, who was on the faculty here uh, for a long time, uh, but left about three years ago. But for those who don't know him, I'm going to briefly introduce him. Um, Majid is a graduate of uh, Shiraz University School of Medicine, where actually I met him exactly four decades ago, to believe it or not. It was exactly four decades ago. When I was a student, I was young faculty there. He became a resident uh, in Shiraz, ID fellow. He was also chief resident uh, uh, for a year, one of the toughest year I've had in my life, both physically and intellectually, because keeping up with him was quite a challenge. And you can imagine what he was like as a young man. He's still young. All of you know the energy that he has. He then uh, was forced out of Iran in 1983, uh, came to the United States, uh, became an intern at St. Mary's Hospital. But Bob Piscatelli, who was the chair of the department, in about a week made him chief resident. And uh, about a month later, he became really a consultant for difficult cases at St. Mary's, be it in general medicine or be it in ID, which was his area of expertise. He went to you know, Chicago to do a formal ID fellowship and then returned back to Connecticut, joined the primary care program, was a social program director for more than a decade, and then uh, recently, about three years ago, uh, left to really begin his own program in global health at the University of Vermont, and is now the director of global health program, University of Vermont, and director of undergraduate medical education at the clinical campus of University of Vermont in Western Connecticut Health Network, University of Vermont College of Medicine. Now, we're honoring Majid today because he is really uh, one of the major forces for development of global health in modern medicine at Yale, beginning with his work uh, in mid-1990s in Russia and then extending to Africa, uh, working with a number of us, being the creative force, the physical energy in moving that forward. Uh, having said all of that, I think most of us honor Majid for being probably one of the uh, few, what I would consider to be a superb clinician, really master clinician, educator. It is a pleasure to stand by the bedside and watch him take history, watch him make a diagnosis, watch him talk to the patient. And that has impacted on the life of many who have come across him, who have been who have had the advantage of having him as a mentor, being in our program, and now in a program that he has, he's developing and has developed at University of Vermont and in Danbury. So it is with great pleasure, Majid, that uh, I invite you to the podium. His talk is going to be Autumn in Liberia, Ebola in West Africa. Uh, please join me to welcome Dr. Sadiq to the podium. Thank you. Dr. Asukar, thank you really very much for kind words and giving me the privilege of having you as a mentor really uh, for the entire life. Uh, obviously, I do have a lot of really uh, stories and things to share with all of you, uh, but I assume we have only 40 probably minutes, so I try really to stay in uh, frame of time and share with you really a little of um, my personal observation uh, during uh, the six weeks that I spent in Liberia. Obviously, I came back and then I was also uh, obliged uh, to stay home for three weeks and that also was another sort of really experience. This is the outline of my talk. Uh, I would give you a little info about the virus and its life cycle, uh, the historical and epidemiological perspective before and after summer of 2014, and why the United States got involved in fighting against Ebola, and going through the U.S. response, particularly infrastructure and training that all of the volunteers they went through before being deployed to Liberia, and then a little talk about the ETU 
uh, which is the Ebola treatment unit and is misnomer because mainly it's uh, Ebola confinement unit. And then uh, go uh, through basically lessons learned, the accomplishments and also the challenges and give you a little uh, stories of the people that in a matter of fact I met in Liberia or some of the patients that I met in uh, Bank ETU. And hopefully, if there is time, I would let you know exactly, hopefully, where we are going to go in future. The virus is elegant, simple virus. It's 100 million year old virus, and probably learned over 100 million years what part of the genome is essential and what part of the genome is not. It has only 10, practically speaking, proteins and is doing all of these diverse clinical manifestation and also adaptation in the modern nature with only 10 basically proteins. All of you, you know that we have plenty number of the filoviruses, they're called phylo because they look like a filament under the microscope and Marburg was the first one that was discovered and now we know exactly that in a matter of fact there is Egyptian fruit bats that you are carrying this uh, filament, filamentous virus. And then obviously when you come to Ebola that we discover Ebola almost seven, six years later uh, is many subspecies. You would see Ebola Sudan, Ebola Zair, Ebola Reston, Ebola Ivory Coast, and Ebola Bodibunjo. Obviously each of these Ebolas the clinical manifestation would be completely different. If you look at, for instance, Ebola Reston, uh, it is not a human pathogen. You zero convert, but is not a human uh, pathogen. Ebola Sudan and Ebola Zaire basically happen at the same time. Uh, Zaire probably is the worst type of the Ebola because in some studies, up to 90% of the population who acquired the symptomatic disease, they died. I will come later on about the asymptomatic version of the Ebola because we are understanding that maybe 70% of the people population, they're exposed to Ebola, but they would never really come down with any symptoms, but they zero convert. And then, obviously, Ebola Ivory Coast, it was the only Ebola in the West Africa, so everybody was expecting if the Ebola comes in West Africa, it's going to be Ebola Ivory Coast. But to surprise of everybody, it turned to be Ebola Zaire. And nobody knows about the clinical manifestation of Ebola Ivory Coast because it only happened in one pathologist who was doing necropsy in a dead chimp. And Ebola Bodibungo happened in Uganda. And as you remember, has the lowest mortality uh, because it's kind of really different because it took even CDC for months basically to identify this one because it was not very much similar to the other group of the Ebolas. The life cycle is simplicity. We have two parts. Obviously the life cycle of the virus in wild and we do not know it very much. As we are speaking, we believe it is in bats. It is particularly, you know, in certain three or four species of bats and we have discovered the pieces of the RNA in bat, particularly in a spleen and also in even kidneys of the bats. And also a certain number of the bats, you are zero converted. You, are, you have evidence serologically that the bat has been exposed to the virus, but it's happening only in very a small fraction of the bats. I would say for phylovirus, for instance, for uh, Marburg virus, maybe less than three or four percent of the bats you are infected or your carrier for the Marburg. Probably for Ebola, even that number is less, maybe less than a percent of the certain species of the bats you are carrying the virus. I believe finally you are going to capture those few percent of the bats and we have no doubt that the bat is the carrier for the Ebola virus as well. How it circulates in the wild, we don't know. If there is a, another, for instance, insect, uh, we don't know. But all that we know, it goes through the bats and then some way gets to the uh, gorillas, to the chimps, to antelopes, 
and is very fatal disease in all group of them and they die or they become sick would be hunted by a hunter and these are really very poor community they are looking for protein and they eat and during the process of making or butchering or making the food not by eating the food during processing the food basically a couple of the people in the community or one person in the community is going to acquire the Ebola and then Ebola unfortunately finally gets to the hospital and because has no symptom specific to Ebola is like typhoid like malaria like another febrile disease unfortunately nobody is going to use any sort of infection control measure uh, would get to a couple of really doctors or nursing staff, and all the time, hospital is amplifier for the epidemic. Many of the doctors would come down, they spread the disease to the patients, and then they spread this also to the community, and then finally, unfortunately, many of the patients, they die, and we are talking about really tribes that they are deeply, culturally believe on certain number, certain procedures, or rituality in burial. I wanted really to show you all of this photo. This is from 1995 Kikwit epidemic, which happened in Congo. And significant number of these people that you see in this photo, they died. They acquired the disease from the, basically the first person who came down with Ebola and died from Ebola, who was a charcoal miner, basically. But unfortunately, this is a challenge because, you know, sometimes in Guinea, for instance, as we are speaking, still, certain number of the tribes, they are following the traditional cultural barriers. And imagine, if I believe strongly that is my father dead, and I'm not going to clean my father, I'm not going to wash my father, I'm not going to take care of the dead body of my father, my father is not going to get to the other world. And his soul is going to hover over the village and it's going to bring sickness, poverty, miserable life to my family members and the rest. I'm not going to really listen to the fact that Ebola is spreading from my father to myself or the family members. To be honest, one of the big lessons that I learned from this trip to, to Liberia, why I didn't have enough really knowledge of the public health why I didn't have really enough knowledge of the anthropology. I wish that an anthropologist was with me or with the United Nations would help basically to do whatsoever intervention you would like to do. You have really to respect the culture and the tradition of the people. And also it is important as a reminder slide that though the RO0 or O dot of the basically the Ebola is 1.5 or 2, but some of the basically dead bodies, they spread the virus to almost 19 or the 20. We have to know the details of the transmission of this virus, and unfortunately, we do not know. Even recently, when you learned that there are one American, one basically UK physicians, they came down with Ebola because of exposure in Sierra Leone, and they were in PPE, full PPE, and they're working in hot zone. Nobody knows really what it happened. I have seen everybody in PPE. You go to the hot zone, and then this is the human. There is nobody under surveillance. And I've seen a couple of my colleagues that they were putting hands on their goggles. Why did we learn from day one, the hands should never raise above the shoulder? And we have to go through training. Just basically, that was one of the training that our hands should never really touch our face. But I have seen my colleagues in temperature of 100 degrees, humidity of 100%, foggy goggles. The hands goes toward the goggle. And contamination of the conjunctiva may happen. We need to know the details of the mode of the transmission of the Ebola, if we would like really to come to a specific strategy to confine it appropriately. This is the historic slide. This is really from New York Times. And just to show you that we knew about this epidemic for a long period of time. We knew it comes mysteriously and picks up and goes away mysteriously. And not happened one time, happened 27 times. 
And then suddenly you can see at the end, we surprise because we, it was not 500, it was not 600 people who came down with Ebola. It was more than really 5,000, 10,000, then 20,000 people came down. And we were thinking, maybe this is the virus that changed the behavior. In a matter of fact, that was the human being behavior that changed, not Ebola. We, as the human race, we are very populous. We are seven billion of us. We are curious. We go to any place. We go to the mines. We go to the sky. We go to planets. And we interface with the ecology of another innocent by standards. And the virus spill over the human, not because the virus wants to spill over the human. That was the human behavior, found roads, and then from the roads basically got to the bigger cities, and the globe becoming tiny, tiny, and then the travelers in less than 20 hours came from the west coast of the Africa to the east coast of the United States. And this is where the epidemic starts. Epidemic starts among one tribe, and this is Kizi ethnic group. And is already young, like most of the Africans, they are very young. African, you know, basically population is bursting and is 1.2 billion. And there are majority of them, they are young. And unfortunately, the countries are poor. And young people, they are mobile. They go from one country to another country for food. They want to see their parents, their family, because this is a Kisi ethnic group. And this is where the Ebola basically uh, came about. And this was the Meliondu, a tiny village of probably 12 or 13 family. And you can see this is the place that gave birth to this epidemic of the Ebola. But all that you can see on this slide, there is a road. You can see there is a road. All that you need to remember in Ebola, Ebola needs a road. Previously, probably almost maybe 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, probably we did have Ebola. But Ebola would come in a tribe. And the tribe, how much that tribe could be mobile, would die off. In a matter of fact, we know that by fact now that maybe 50, 70 percent of the population, they are asymptomatic, they are convert, and most likely they are going to be immune to the virus. And they add to the herd, basically, immunity. And the virus is going to be confined if there is no road. But then you can see Bodo Bodo. And then also you can see a truck is coming through this road. And then, unfortunately, from two-year-old boy, the virus got to the sister of the boy, and then from the boy, a sister to the mother was pregnant, then to a grandmother, and the grandmother didn't stay in the village. So listen, I have lost three members of my family. Let's move on, go to another hospital. And then the tragedy, unfortunately, happened, and then went to the big city, and now we are learning that majority of time, in a matter of fact, confinement of Ebola in big city is much easier than the confinement of Ebola in tiny village with very bad roads that you cannot really get to any of those. But unfortunately, during the beginning of the epidemic, the city also was amplifier because nobody knows about the disease and nobody could do much about the disease. All that I want to say, over three months, March 23, and December of the 23rd of the December, so over three months, only 62 people came down with Ebola. And then the Ebola was unleashed. So this means the virus is not really contagious, and it is not frightening. It is not contagious. We were lucky. If it was like measles, if it was like something like this norovirus, and with fatality of the Ebola, then we would have really dealing with a life-threatening and tragedy uh, internationally. And here, I want to show you that basically based on those, all of the curves, you know, WHO, CDC, all of those look at the curve and say, listen, this looks like the old epidemies and it's going to go away. So they pulled out and they didn't know the virus already is in the towns. And then unfortunately, as you can see, then during the summer, the second curve or the second peak of the epidemic emerged. It was completely new. Nobody knew that the virus is going to have double harm curve. 
And we didn't know about nothing about the virus. And I know that many of us, we are criticizing the or why, why we sent, for instance, so many troops to West Africa. Why do you made so many of the ETUs? All that we did was based on the evidence that we did have a year ago. Now we have more of the lessons that we learned and hopefully we can apply it for another, another you know, outbreak in future. And then obviously, uh, I want just to say that from my perspective, Ebola epidemic had two seasons, was the Ebola before getting to the United States and Ebola after getting to the United States. So, <clears throat> and then unfortunately as soon as it got to the United States, I don't know really why we totally forgot about the evidence behind the Ebola. We knew the R0 of the virus is 1.5, and that was almost from, you know, even 1976 we knew about the dynamics of the virus. It was not something really new to us. Basic scientists, they did do a lot of work on the virus because they put the virus in a tube and then they lyse the virus and everything and the virus is clean and non-infectious. So they dissect it, they open it, and we know everything about the details of the virus. Probably American army scientists and Russian army scientists, probably even they know how they can hybrid it to make it a virus is R0 of 25. We knew the details, but we didn't know nothing about how this virus behaves in the human, how the virus really kills, how the virus makes somebody really sick because you have to be at the bedside of a patient 24 hours to learn about clinical manifestation of the disease. I want also to tell you that really Ebola is not really very fatal. It is fatal in Africa. It is not fatal if the patient is going to get to the United States. If you look at the studies, you can see they say MSF because MSF you have robust data. You know exactly you're talking about the confirmed cases. You would see 5,300 Basically, they have the uh, you know, healthcare workers, 4,000 of them are nationals, 25 of them, they acquired the Ebola, 14 of them, they died because they were not evacuated to any other place. They died at home. Expatriates, we had 1,300 expatriates, three of them acquired the Ebola, and still we don't know exactly how they acquired the Ebola, but they acquired the Ebola and they evacuated and all of them, they survived. I can give you more statistics. Unfortunately, you can see 861 of the healthcare workers, so far they have come down with Ebola, and mortality, unfortunately, among the healthcare workers is even higher than the public who comes with Ebola. And now we are learning that, in a matter of fact, many majority of the, uh, of the healthcare workers that they acquire the disease, they are not acquiring disease in the hot zone. They are acquiring disease in the yellow zone or they acquire disease in the community. Particularly healthcare workers in Liberia, imagine if you are a doctor, you are going to be one doctor per 100,000 population. So your, you know, your members of your tribe, your family, they are sick, they call you, you have really to outreach to them, you need to take care of them, so you are going to come down really with Ebola. But when you are in full PPE, that from my perspective, you are putting too many layers unnecessarily to the fact that probably the chance of contamination is going to be more. But during the summer, even they didn't have gloves. I interviewed some of those who worked in some of the basically hospitals in Monrovia. And they said, to be honest, we didn't have even gloves during the summertime. Forget about the full PPE. When the Ebola got to the United States, obviously, uh, finally, uh, the Ebola administration, as you remember, they budget one point of four billion dollars uh, toward confinement and treatment of Ebola. Uh, the money, obviously, was given to United Aid, which United, USID, for international development. And then, obviously, they need some of the non-governmental organization to basically recruit, uh, you know, healthcare workers, nursing staff, and also doctors, and deploy them to West Africa. And 
You can see the complexity of the organogram. You know, WHO, CDC, they were consultant. Everybody was working for uh, governments of the Liberia or Sierra Leone. Obviously, uh, UK was more involved with Sierra Leone, and France was more involved with Guinea, and United States, it was completely natural to work mainly in Liberia. Then, obviously, a letter was circulated about the infectious disease uh, specialist. It came from uh, American Society of uh, Infectious Diseases. It came from uh, Consortium of University in Global Health. It came from uh, different uh, non-governmental organizations, including Americans, requesting that really, please, we need help because we need to get really to West Africa and we need to confine the outbreak. I think really uh, the challenge was basically we would love to see academia to be involved because we need badly those people who are very knowledgeable in infectious diseases. But I think even if one or two hands went up in any of the academic uh, basically centers, they were not really supported because you know six weeks, nine weeks, ten weeks of you know getting that time and going to West Africa, it was not really uh, very easy. But I thought really uh, I need to go. Not really the fact that my university support me, and in a matter of fact, two of us from the University of Vermont, we were supported to go to West Africa. But I was strongly really believed that caring for people in need and teaching others to do so have long defined medicine professional ethics. We have to do. And obviously, I need really to. I you know basically convinced my wife, and when we listen to the stories of the people from Liberia, and my wife, my family, in a matter of five days, were very much supportive of the idea, and I did go. Before going, obviously, we were trained in Alabama uh, by CDC members, and then finally, really, we went to Monrovia. I did have a little really anxiety. I shouldn't have said really that frenzy and the fear did not really get into me. It did. I remember when I was landed in uh, uh, Morocco, and that was the last leg of my flight from Morocco to Monrovia, and I was heading toward the plane, and I said, my goodness, you know, this is the only way that, you know, this is one way if I go. I don't know what would happen to me. Shall I really return? So that question came to my mind. And then I saw all of these young Americans, 22, 23, and a couple of them were nursing the staff, and they told me, they have three kids. I said, hey, how come you, know, you have three kids? Say, hey, I have a good husband. He's taking care of my kids. <laughs> and then I said, okay, I'm with you people. Thanks, American, really, uh, you know, um, a millennial generation. Thank you. You are so generous. You are so phenomenon and you're so humanistic and you're amazing really population. I went really to Liberia, a land in Liberia, and this is one of the photo shots that I took from my basically window. And this is end of the rainy season. Every single night we had about three, four inches of rain. And this is what I would see a girl 12, 13 is watering the plant. I said, my goodness. You know, that anxiety, if that was this much, became this much. And then when I saw myself in the hot zone, when I saw myself at the bedside of a crying eight-year-old kid with substantial number of the subcutaneous abscesses, anxiety went away immediately. For the first time, I understood who am I, why I am a doctor. And that tiny, tiny, really tiny anxiety melted away. I want to really uh, tell you that in Monrovia also, we had very vigorous training, and the training happened in Monrovia Police Academy by American servicemen. American servicemen, they were amazing in West Africa. A smart, passionate, lovely, and they did everything. They construct the ETUs, they mop the floors, they bury the dead bodies, and they teach us. Amazing group. 
3,500 of them in West Africa. And I'm totally surprised if they were not in West Africa, what we would be doing in West Africa. They were cardinal part, or essential part of the, the effort of the United States in confinement of the Ebola in West Africa. This is another shot from my basically window, but this is in Buchanan. And I was, day one, I was totally basically surprised that I see this, really, these are the homes. I was thinking these are the shops, but later on I learned that in a matter of fact, these are the homes, and everybody is basically jobless in Liberia, and 94% of the population, they don't have even electricity. And then I saw these buildings, one, two, three, four, five, myriads of them, solid building, but left uncomplete, not really done. And then you need to remember the history, bloody history of the Liberia, and then you remember 12th of the April of 1980, then finally William Talbert was assassinated by uh, basically Samuel Doe, who was really a soldier at that time, but is from the African Liberian, and the government was in the hand of the American Liberian for 200 years, and that is the Pulitzer Award-winning photo of the same day that 13 members of the cabinet they were executed in one of the shores of the Liberia. And then we sent basically to the Bond County, and the Bond County basically had ETU, so that's where basically we try to learn the administrative and also take patient care before finally go back to the Buchanan and to establish one of the first ETU, American ETUs. And this is the uh, Cottington uh, University, I don't know if it's famous or infamous, is one of the universities in Liberia, but was the site of the training of the Charles Taylor's militia, and even Charles Taylor was living almost a mile down of the, uh, of the uh, Cottington's uh, University. And this was my dorm, basically. We are, we are living in this dorm. It was a student dorm. Obviously, it was closed. And this is my room, and I would say, particularly, I know sometimes there were two in this room, and sometimes it was me alone. And if I was alone, I would use this bed for my desk, and I was typing, I was doing all of my homework. In, and then, uh, the only thing that I want to remember, I want really, the challenge really was not really taking care of the ETU patients. The challenge was really dealing with these uh, beetles, and they are named them um, Nairobi's flies, but they are not really flies, they are beetles. And they have a toxin, this is a pedatrine toxin that now we are using it for as an anti-cancer medication because it's going to stick to the DNA. And it, is, it runs in the hemolymph of the uh, pederus. And the pederus loves really decaying uh, leaves and how much decaying leaves you want in Liberia, you're welcome because uh, they get 200 to 300, 400 inches of rain annually. And that's amazing. Somebody made the record one inch of a rain in eight minutes. And then they come, they crawl on you, they don't beat. You have to really learn just to brush them away. If you smash them, you're in bad shape because the toxin is going to come, you don't notice even, and then 36 hours, 48 hours, like the recluse a spider bite, everything is going to dissolve and come out. And many of us, we did have this, and I made a joke that basically, this is the tattoo, if you don't have this tattoo, you can't go to the hot zone. This is the tattoo. <laughs> and then telling you a little, because you know, in the next maybe five minutes, I'm going to just orient you very briefly about the, about the uh, ETU. Uh, obviously, uh, this is kind of really a slide that you know, brings some uh, you know, uh, hopelessness. But I want to tell you, in a matter of fact, ETU, I saw so many of the amazing human souls, beautiful humans, that they were singing and they were dancing and they were taking care of the patients all at the same time. These were us that we became paralyzed. It amazed me, to be honest, when I land in Monrovia, I said, this is me that I'm coming from epicenter of Ebola to some place that Ebola doesn't exist. And that was reality. Life continued. And this is, unfortunately, this is Ebola leper colony. They, both of them, they are very close to each other, both of them on the top of a hill. 
brings a lot of really injustice in the history of the medicine, similarity between Ebola and leprosy. And then off the road, inside the rainforest, and then finally you come uh, to the Bonn County ETU, which is basically run by the International Medical Corp. And you see it is on the top of the, basically, uh, hill. And then in brief, the ETU, basically, uh, you have the uh, three zones. You have clean, but I would say clean, but you know, just high traffic, but it's clean because there is no need proven patient in clean. Then you have low zone, and then obviously you have the hot zone. The hot zone is basically there are two tents or four tents, tents for cases of suspects, and then obviously confirmed. I'm telling you, when I got to Bond County, uh, because CDC did have a lab, which was only three miles away, in less than two or three hours we knew that a patient has Ebola or the patient doesn't have Ebola. So we wouldn't really keep very many patients in suspect. But in some other places, it would take two, three days really to get the lab back. So the patient would stay in suspect for two or three days. But then you would send them to the hot tent when you know they have definitely Ebola. And if they don't have Ebola, obviously they would be discharged to another facility or get back home. And this is the triage. And then you can see the donning and the doffing. And then every, the flow is one way. You come this way, then you go this way, then you go this way, and you go this way. You never go this way. So if there is some medical records, for instance, in the hot zone, put a stay in the hot zone. And they burn it. Medical record is disaster in the hot zone. What you have, you have really a completely, you know, a torn apart piece of the paper and a checkbox. Nausea, yes. Even you don't see in foggy goggles that you are checking the right, basically, box or not. There is no any description of nothing, basically. And then you leave everything behind. And then you come with your foggy memory. Two hours later on, when you are exhausted, you sit around the table, and then you say, oh, bed number three, I think really had abdominal distension, or Z, or Y. Uh, this is a couple of photos from the, uh, from the low or yellow zone. And then you can see this was the donning, and this is the this is donning, this is doffing, and this is the triage. So the ambulance usually drop the patient here, and then the nursing staff or the doctors would come this way, go to the triage, and if the patient needs to be admitted, the doctors would go to the back door, go to the triage on the other end, and then help the patient to get admitted. This is the uh, boots uh, yard. So when we would come first, we are going to pick up our boots, basically, and then go to this room. Uh, this is the place that we would change, is blocker. Then you can see the boards and information of the patient is going to be reflected in. And then this is the donning, and obviously this is the doffing and 21 steps, 22 steps of the donning and doffing. You know that that protocol is not going to work. 21, 22 steps is deemed to fail. And then the triage is outside. If somebody would walk or a family member is going to bring the patient. So we did have also a triage, basically a kind of in perimeter of the ETU. And then if the ambulance would bring, you can see everything should be a spray and they would a spray and then the ambulance would drop the patient in triage, and then the doctor and nursing staff, after donning, would get to the triage. And this is the triage that you can see the patient sits here, and the doctors are here. It's almost six meters really apart. And then if they need to get to the, uh, basically, ETU or admitted, and the doctors will go from the other door and then pick them up and then admit them. And then we have only simple algorithm, you know, couple of really questions. Uh, have you have contact with sick person or dead body? And the question is going to be, the answer is going to be yes. The second question is going to be fever. Do you have fever or did you have any time fever? And if said yes, then is obviously you go through the yes part. But if said no to both, uh, then the patient is going to go home or another place. But you can see if I'm really afraid of being admitted to ETU, and you come to ETU, you ask me, have you been in touch with any dead body? I would say no. And then we say, okay, do you have fever? I would say no. 
Right? It's, it's easy to say no. And then thermometers, to be honest, none of them. I shouldn't say none, but overwhelming majority of the thermometers, they didn't work. My temperature was as low as, you might not believe it, 56 degrees. I said, my goodness, I, I, I'm winning the lizards on the temperature. But it's simple algorithm, basically, to screen them. But obviously, you definitely may make significant really mistakes. Language barrier, they speak English. They speak English, but to be honest, it's completely another language. They don't understand me, I don't understand them. I needed to bring a translator, basically, to translate the English language from one source to another form. And this is the hot zone, and I want to tell you that this part is the hot zone, and this is the low zone, this is laundry. So many of us, really, we would be here, particularly on Thursday nights, when it was movie night. And those of you who think this is airborne disease, the smoke was coming from that, the wind was coming from the hot zone, to us, and none of us, really, we did come down with a boat. We would shake, you know, just to say, how are you? And then it was almost two meters really away. This is the border of the hot zone and the yellow zone. And this is the laundry. And this is one of us, basically, in the hot zone. And this is, you can see, the uh, incinerators. And everything should be burned. Not really the bodies, please. This is all the disposables and then the PPEs, garbage. And then this is the uh, suspect tent. And you will see one patient is sitting under the shade of the, uh, of the tent in the hot zone. I just really, my observation of the patients is obviously very limited. You know, it was sketchy, you know, two hours here, two hours there. Reviewing the literature, you can basically, you know, categorize the patient into three category, green, yellow, red. And green, hemodynamically stable and doesn't need assistance. Yellow, hemodynamically stable but needs assistance. And the red, hemodynamically unstable, leave that person alone. So, comfort care. In a matter of fact, nobody was in pain. And I don't know, because it is culturally it is not desirable to show that they have pain. So, nobody complained that I have pain, and we never used any morphine. And if we want to use something, we would use Tylenol. In yellow, we put all of energy in yellow, because they need fluid. And I'm telling you, 90% of them they would only drink water, and because I want to make it really look like a drug, I usually put some colors, you know, vitamin E colors, and then we call it medicine. This is not water, this is medicine. You have really to drink it. IV was a challenge, to be honest, because everybody was afraid of really puncturing, and because, you know, they say 100% is the, you know, the spread of the virus through the vena puncture, but I have not seen any evidence in literature. Obviously, everybody who did come down with venipuncture, with Ebola, has been reported in literature. But those that had the incident and they didn't come down with the viremia, they are not really reported in literature. I know somebody, a scientist in Russia, did have the venipuncture, and she did not report it till time that she was really sick because she didn't like to report it to, his, to her authority because in Russia it's not good. Basically, you do something wrong, I assume. But I would say that probably is underreported and mortality is not really very known. And this is the morgue. So the patients from here, they would go to the morgue, and this is the morgue, and then the body... I would go through this path uh, to six feet deep graves uh, because uh, the rain, particularly, as I said, may wash away the bodies, and that's what you learn. Uh, during the summer, uh, the rainy season, uh, many of the bodies were floating in the streets of Monrovia, for instance, uh, so they have to be really very, very, uh, very deep. And obviously, there were few survivors, you know, about maybe 30% of the patient they survived. And the challenge really was uh, when you are in ETU, in ETU and you are in PPE, I assume you have only 100 minutes. Somebody is you know, writing the time, and somebody is carefully basically watching you. And then it is 100 minutes, then you have to come out. Uh, but when you are coming out, unfortunately, then you have to stay in queue of the people because a sprayer needs to spray you from head to the toe, and sometimes it takes 20, 25 minutes to stay under the equator sun. That was really the major challenge. And then we would come out, a friend of mine, it could be me, because as soon as we come out, 
Uh, we are so exhausted. You need a chair, and then for three hours, to be honest, you are only dreaming for a cold drink or Coke, you know, something of that kind. But you can see my friends, you are just exhausted, and this is basically uh, the exhaustion because we lost, I would say, between 1.5 to 3% of the body weight. And rehydration is a challenge because you know you need a lot of fluid. But if you take fluid before getting into the PPE, uh, then you will say, my goodness, you know, 100 minutes, then I want to pee. So it's, it's not practical. And then you're coming out, to be honest, you're so exhausted that even you can't really reach to any bottle. Somebody else needs to put IV for you and then re-energize you, I assume. And then the data collection, I told you, is really the challenge. The data from interior coming to the yellow is more on the memory. And then you can see here, I put it here uh, intentionally because look at the lab. Uh, there is only the PCR for the, uh, for the R for RNA virus, for the, uh, for the Ebola. Uh, we, didn't, we couldn't really check potassium, we couldn't check the sodium. Uh, we couldn't do nothing, no test, practically speaking. And that's the reason I said, really, to be honest, these are the confinement centers which are phenomenal because this is the only way that we can really confine Ebola, but there are no means really even close to the uh, treatment unit. Then, obviously, there are so many phenotypes of the clinical manifestation of the virus, and we do not know how, basically, what are the determinants of the phenotypes. This is the virus, this is the human. Look, basically, for instance, how many percent of the people are going to be seroconverted uh, asymptomatically, and then mild symptoms, GI symptoms. If even somebody, for instance, have hiccups, I don't know exactly this hiccup is from the abdominal distension, or this is the something in diaphragm, or this is central nervous system. None of this sort of really detailed clinical observation is available. I want also just to show you one of the studies came from Sergio Leone, and then they said, for instance, the patient has diarrhea. What kind of diarrhea? If this is inflammatory diarrhea, this is the basically secretory diarrhea, nobody has a study the stool of the patient with Ebola. We don't know how much sodium is in the stool, how much potassium is in the stool. In cholera, you have plenty of literature. You come to Ebola, I don't know. We have white cells in the stool, we do have the red cell in the stool. We have nothing really when we come to the details of the clinical manifestation of, of the disease. And finally, got, you know, after basically working in Buchanan, we got back, I'm sorry, in Bank County, we uh, basically deployed to Buchanan uh, to establish really the ETU. And this is American ETU. Beautiful, big, nice. You know, we have even air conditioning system, you can see, and then it was slow. It was slow. I'm not really, because you know, you know, time, you know, I'm probably I'm going to finish in one minute. It just basically, I don't want to be judgmental. I don't want really to criticize anybody because I know it was very hard. We didn't know about the virus. We, whatsoever we did based on the uh, stories of the Ebola from the last basically 40 years on mini, mini macro epidemic. But these were made, even you can see we have observational unit. We could really even put somebody in observational unit and 24 hours, we could observe whether they seized, how they seized, if they have abdominal pain, what they say, but all of those things was in place. But we never ever had even, thanks God, one case of Ebola in any of the, I would say not any, but probably in overwhelming majority of the ETUs of the American built in West Africa, they never really saw a case of Ebola because everything was slow. We made, for instance, ETU, the servicemen, they made the ETU, and when they made the ETU, then at the end, somebody from uh, International uh, Organization of Migration came with a checklist. It was a very young Egyptian, 24-year-old doctor, and they said, there are 21 errors in this ETU that needs to be revised. And that was the end. Already the ETU was basically, we were hoping that next morning we are going to admit patients. 
But now, and I said, I said, listen, you know, it's kind of really surprising to me because I live in Woodbridge, and if I want to do really one minor revision on my ceiling or my basement, I have to go to the town hall, get permit, all of those things. Now you're telling me that all of this one mount or two mounts, nobody came and supervised the construction of the ETU? And the answer is that this is our protocol. But then we need new money. This new money needs to be approved by USAID. Took time, by the time the revision were made, was 22nd of December. 22nd of the December. 11 of the ETUs, American ETUs, only one was built before December 22nd in November. The rest, they were made after January. And as you know, after January 2015, Practically speaking, we are dealing with one or two or three cases of Ebola in some parts of the Monrovia or close to Monrovia. That's all that we have. Right now, we do not have any case of the ETU. Right now, the problem is going to be vaccination. You know, we want to really try this INF bill, basically vaccines in, in Liberia. But now, the, please, let's go to Guinea because we do have patients with Guinea. I do not think this is going to happen, to be honest. By the time they are going to meet in Geneva, they are going to sign things, then ethical team comes, then all, there is not going to be. Modern nature is going to claim whatsoever that fate of the Ebola in Guinea is going to be, and the human being intervention is not going to be really great. But I want to really leave you with a good note, and that is really my final really slide, and that's basically our you know, I'm sorry, I knew that. This is the final. <laughs> the positive side, if you look at this group, this is 25 of the internationals or expatriates, and we had 170 librarians in one of the ETUs, and we had 20 ETUs. And imagine somebody like myself, I'd rotate only six weeks. So imagine. How many of the Americans, France, people from England, people from other parts of the board, even Ukrainians, even from the East Africa, from West Africa, they trained for confinement of the outbreak. That was positive and positive. Now you have a group of the people who have been completely trained to confine the outbreak. Next outbreak, I think really we have a lot of the lessons from this outbreak. And next time, we are ready, ready to serve. This time, we were willing to serve. But next time, really, we are ready, ready uh, to serve. Thank you really very much.